Okay, so my colleagues tell me I can start. Well, welcome uh, to everybody. Um, good afternoon and welcome to this, uh, this seminar on the evolution of European banking supervision. So my name is Connie Lotze and I work in, uh, uh, on banking supervision communications and uh, I'm very happy to, uh, that you're joining us for this session. Um, let me just say a few words and then I will say something on the housekeeping, um, uh, which you probably know, and then I'll introduce my esteemed colleagues here who will um, then lead the session. So, um, as you know, ever since the fin great financial crisis, uh, the ECB and the national supervisor have been working on keeping the banking system safe and sound. I mean, we're almost 10 years old now. Um, our consistent and standardized supervision throughout the euro area helps keep uh, people's money safe and ensures that the banks can weather a crisis and continue to perform their vital functions, such as granting loans to people and firms and into the economy. So uh, since 2014, as I said, had, this has been our mission. In the last decade, we have indeed weathered a few storms and the, banking, uh, and the European banking sector has shown remarkable resilience. Uh, this underlines obviously the need for and the effectiveness of the enhanced regulatory and supervisory reforms that we have implemented. And our style of supervision has adapted to the, this ever-changing external environment uh, and that has allowed us to get through um, these uh, uh, difficult periods such as the COVID-19 pandemic and more recently also the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So over the next hour, my colleagues here on this panel and uh, will discuss uh, these issues with you and, and answer your questions and uh, I'm happy to take your comments. A couple of housekeeping rules before, um, be, uh, after the, the presentation, we will keep, uh, we will uh, go to your questions and your comments. Uh, we would encourage you to turn on your camera so we can see you because right now we're speaking sort of into a, a, a black hole here, but, uh, but that's okay for now um, because we will have this presentation by our uh, colleagues. If you have any technical problems, please write to host in the chat box and a member of our team will um, assist you right away. So, um, and one more last thing, uh, this seminar is uh, being recorded and will be published on our website uh, in the coming days. So now let's come to our speakers. Um, I'm very happy to have with me here Lynette Field, who is the Director General of On-Site and Internal Model in Inspections, and Sofia Toscano Rico, who is Deputy Director General of Horizontal Line Supervision. So they will present to you the origins of a single supervisory mechanism, the evolution of supervisory, our supervisory approach, uh, talk about the priorities and a bit on, and touch a bit on the, uh, the bank situation in light of the, uh, the March 2023 turmoil. So, um, and then the second part, as I said, we will come to your comments and, uh, and questions. So now, um, without any further ado, I'm very happy to um, hand over to um, Lynette and Sophia, and I think Lynette will start the presentation, please. Thank you very much, uh, Connie, and also uh, good afternoon from my side. I think this is a really very welcome opportunity for us to engage with uh, civil society organizations. So very much looking forward to the session. I believe uh, the colleagues should be able to see the slides. As Connie said, uh, Sophia and I will go through you know, how banking supervision has evolved since the SSM was created and also a little bit about where we think it's heading. Um, we will also share some reflections about the state uh, of the banks, um, the current supervisory priorities, and also um, some reflections about the impact of the turmoil that we experienced in March. So I'm going to uh, move to this slide, and this is really a recalling a little bit of history. Um, where did European banking supervision come from? Um, we had, of course, the global financial crisis starting around 2007, and in, in the early 2010s um, in Europe, we had the sovereign debt crisis, um, and those revealed some important weaknesses. Uh, first of all, in the banks themselves, um, what we saw was that the capital and liquidity buffers of the banks were insufficient, but even more fundamentally, their risk management uh, governance um, was insufficient and also there were some um, you know, excessive uh, risk taking in the banks. There were also clear weaknesses in the framework for dealing with banks that get into difficulties, so banks that get into crisis situations, and that was particularly the case for cross-border large banks. What we were seeing was that you know, there was very much a focus on national approaches, national solutions. Um, and finally, as supervisors, we also had some 
lessons to learn. Uh, supervision was not as proactive as it should have been. Um, the cooperation between national supervisory authorities was not working as it should. And we had a situation where uh, banks with similar risks were being supervised in different ways. So we had a very extensive set of reforms um, as a result of these uh, crises. Um, some of those had their um, origin in global uh, discussions and some are specific to Europe. So uh, first of all, we had a very large um, regulatory reform, global driven regulatory reform, which was focused on raising standards in banks. So capital, liquidity buffers, the buffers the banks need to protect them in case of uh, problems, um, a focus on improving governance and risk management, new instruments also to deal with risks at the system level rather than just at the bank level and instruments for dealing with weak banks. So this was a global reform predominantly but it was implemented in Europe through the single rule book. And that's an important point because um, up until that point, European legislation for banks had been written in the form of directives, which then had to be taken by national governments and national authorities, transposed and implemented. So there was always scope for differences. Whereas um, what we had from 2013 was a regulation on capital requirements that's directly applicable and is, is, uh, doesn't need to be um, uh, uh, transposed in any way. Um, we also had the creation of two new European mechanisms, two um, new authorities under the framework of what we call the banking union. So we had European supervision, which was the creation of the single supervisory mechanism, or SSM as we call it, and the um, single resolution mechanism for crisis management and resolution. SSM started working um, from November 2014 and the uh, SRM from the beginning of 2015. So if we then look at the SSM, you know, what is it and how does it work? Um, essentially, or, you know, in a nutshell, what it is, it's a banking supervision, supervision system. Uh, it covers the whole banking industry in the euro area countries, plus um, one country which has joined um, in what we call close cooperation, which is a mechanism that allows um, EU countries, uh, which are not Euro countries, to join uh, the SSM. And it's actually one of the largest banking supervisory authorities in the world. It's a system, as I said, so it's a system of the ECB together with the national competent authorities. And we make a distinction between two types of banks. We have what we call, uh, or what the regulation calls, significant institutions, which are the largest, uh, more sort of cross-border international banks, if you like. Um, and they, those are called significant institutions. Uh, there are currently 110 of those, and they are covering more than 80% of the banking assets uh, across the SSM. Those banks are supervised directly, um, and that's done through what we call joint supervisory teams. And those joint supervisory teams are led by the ECB and comprised of ECB and NCA members. Um, for the smaller banks, and there are around 2,000 uh, yeah, 2, of those, which is you know, a bit less than 20% of the overall banking assets in the system, these are still supervised directly by the national supervision authorities, or we call them also um, national competent authorities. So you might hear us refer to NCAs, that's, that's what we're talking about, the national authorities. Um, and the ECB is playing then an oversight role for those smaller institutions. Of course, we also have some horizontal and support functions. So within the ECB, we have functions who are giving expertise to our supervisory teams on certain risks. We have on-site methodologies, um, on-site inspections and methodologies. Um, so we have uh, quite a lot of also horizontal functions there. So that's the SSM. What about the banking system? What's happened in the banking system um, since the creation of the SSM and since this um, regulatory reform, I think what you can see on this chart is clearly an uh, improvement in the resilience of the banks. If you look on the left-hand side, this is the capital buffers. Um, you see clear improvement. This is really focusing on the capital, which is of the highest quality, so the most loss-absorbing capital. Um, the middle chart is uh, looking at non-performing loans. So these are loans where there is um, then there are late repayments or the, uh, the borrower is unlikely to, to repay the loan. And this has been a real priority of the SSM since the beginning, because when the SSM started, there were one trillion um, non-performing loans in the system. And that's a lot. Uh, it's something more than 7.5 percent, I think, of overall loans. And that really has put a lot of um, burden on the banking sector um, and you know has meant that the banking sector has not been able to 
to lend, uh, to make new lending, it's been really sort of stifled by, by this high level of, of non-performing loans. Uh, uh, means that they're not able to really, the banks are not really able to play their role in the in financing uh, the economy. So we've had a very tough exercise to bring down the um, NPLs, and that has been actually uh, quite successful, as you can see on the chart. Um, the chart on the right is more looking at sort of profitability uh, related topics and for us uh, it's important that banks have a sort of sustainable profitability because this is um, ensuring their resilience over time. This has been a difficult topic to address but um, what we've seen in recent uh, couple of years are some improvements um, also linked uh, to interest rate uh, rises. Um, so that's what we've seen in the banks. Um, what about how our banking supervision has evolved? Um, the SSM has been functioning, I mean, officially entered into force in November 2014, so has been functioning for nearly nine years. Um, I would say in the early years, the focus was really on bringing together these supervisory practices that were um, rather different across the different countries. We've spent a lot of time and energy on bringing those practices together, harmonizing, um, and also addressing some of the key uh, weaknesses that we saw in the system. So uh, we had a lot of codification of you know, supervisory practices. We prepared a lot of regulations, manuals, frameworks, processes, you know, really trying to get more harmonization. And I would say one of the key achievements there was the um, common supervisory review and evaluation process, which uh, we call the SREP. And that's a very key process for us as supervisors to look at the bank's risks, the internal controls, um, and the measures that need to be taken, and also the adequacy of capital and liquidity. It's a super important process, and we were able to, to find harmonization there. Um, we also ran three very important projects, uh, one of which was, you know, before we took over supervision, we conducted a comprehensive assessment looking at the balance sheets and also stressing the balance sheets of the banks that were going to come under our supervision so that we could um, identify actions that needed to be taken. This was also published. It was also an exercise in transparency. Uh, we also focused, as I said, on getting down uh, non-performing loans. And we conducted a, an extensive review of banks' internal models, so uh, bank models that they are using to calculate parts of their capital needs and manage their business. So this, as a foundation, I think has served us very well. And we've seen, um, you know, the situation of the banking sector has improved. But now, as we mature as a banking supervisory authority, I think our common practices are much more embedded uh, now. And so we don't need to focus as much as we did in those early years on this codification um, approaches, but we can really look more towards risk prioritization, risk focus, agility and accountability. And we've taken a number of initiatives. Um, we've been increasing the flexibility for our uh, supervisors um, to apply their own judgment, to focus on the priorities and to address the bank's specific needs. So we've had, um, we've developed a risk tolerance framework and a a process for doing the the strap, the supervisory review and evaluation process over a multi years, which also allows the supervisors to adapt accordingly. We've had an increased push for transparency over recent years, uh, including on on strap methodologies, but also towards the banks in terms of you know outcomes and messages. Um, and also, as we focus less on this ex ante harmonisation of practices, we have created a new function that looks at you know are the outcomes of our supervision uh, um, consistent? Are we being effective in our supervision? This is what we are calling our, our second line of defense. And that was part of the internal reorganization we had in October 2020. Um, maybe also to mention more recently, we commissioned an external review of our threat process, and that produced some very important and um, wide ranging findings and recommendations that we are now discussing and implementing. So that said, I will now pass to Sophia, who will talk about the SSM priorities and recent events. Sophia. Thanks a lot, uh, Ninette, and uh, welcome from my side uh, as well. It's a pleasure to be here and to talk about uh, these issues uh, with you. Um, so Lynette was mentioning that we um, we moved as an organization in terms of how we, we, we conduct supervision into a much more risk focused uh, uh, and identification of priorities is a key uh, element of being able to be to be risk focused. Um, 
we have an internal process that allows us to identify what are the main risks uh, that we need to tackle from a supervisory uh, perspective um, and to set then uh, what are our supervisory uh, priorities in a way that then the work plan uh, of, the, of the, uh, the SSM, of the mechanism, so the, the ECB um, um, part, but also the, the, the NCA uh, colleagues that are working in the joint supervisory teams have a clear um, identification of the areas of priority and also the horizontal uh, functions um, uh, can uh, devote uh, uh, their uh, efforts to also looking into those uh, priority areas of, of risk that, uh, that uh, are being identified. So how do we do it? Uh, we have um, uh, an annual uh, process um, that is uh, setting uh, the priorities for the following three years. Um, you might ask, uh, why do we have it annual if the priorities are for the next uh, three years? But the idea is that every year we go back and see if the priorities that were set for a three years horizon are still adequate and still uh, uh, making sense given the evolution of the of the of the risk uh, of the risk landscape so we do it to be able uh, to ensure uh, that we keep flexible and being able to adjust to any new uh, priorities that uh, that may come um, in this uh, uh, risk identification and priority setting uh, process we try to um, ensure a good interaction between uh, um, uh, the macro perspective uh, on uh, what we see risks uh, to financial um, stability with the micro perspective of, uh, of the individual uh, banks. Um, and we, uh, with this, uh, we, we try to, to identify uh, both through a, a top-down and a bottom-up uh, process that includes uh, an horizon scanning uh, for the risks and, uh, and, uh, and this will allow us to identify the main areas of uh, focus. We do it together with the, with the national competent authorities, and we do it uh, uh, in a way that um, uh, ensures uh, a risk-based uh, uh, analysis. We make these priorities transparent, so we published the priorities to also uh, ensure um, that the banks are aware of where will be our supervisory uh, attention, but also to allow for, for accountability of our supervisory uh, uh, activity. Of course, the priorities are not the only things that we focus uh, on during our um, supervisory uh, processes uh, uh, and cycle. Um, we, we have to conduct a number of exercises that come from the regulatory framework or uh, that are follow-up to previous uh, priorities where we want to make sure that banks addressed the concerns uh, that were identified in, in those uh, analysis. But this, it's quite a, a significant uh, part of, of our work uh, that is being set up um, uh, in, this, in this process. Um, we thought it would be interesting to, to, to run you through what are our priorities for, um, for the, the three years ahead, so 2023 to 2025. And you will see, uh, if you look at the, the ones that were there uh, last year, they did not change a lot in terms of uh, broader prior priorities. So the first priority is really to ensure that the banks uh, uh, and the banking sector uh, uh, remains or even um, enhances uh, its release, resilience um, and is prepared to face any uh, um, macro-financial or geopolitical uh, shocks. Um, as you know, we are, we are coming from the COVID-19 uh, uh, crisis. Then uh, we had, as, as already mentioned, uh, the invasion of uh, Ukraine by, by Russia, and we had the market uh, turmoil of, of March. So we have had a number of uh, um, turbulence in the, in the, in the recent uh, years, and making sure that the banks are re resilient to, to, to be able to face uh, those situations is being one of our key priorities. So we continue to focus on uh, credit risk uh, management, namely um, with particular attention on most uh, vulnerable uh, sectors, um, 
that were uh, until uh, very recently the energy intensive uh, sectors also now looking uh, uh, more into residential real estate commercial real estate uh, but also we are looking with particular attention to uh, the funding sources um, uh, uh, of banks and to their to their funding uh, plans um, to ensure that these are diversified and will be able to uh, handle uh, the phasing out of the TTL, TRO, so the monetary policy normalization as well. As second priority, uh, we have uh, um, more uh, structural uh, challenges that the banking sector is, is facing, and they are mainly uh, linked to digitalization, but also to, um, to governance and risk management. And we will see in the next slides when we uh, also have a, 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 a zoom in into the, into the March term oil, uh, why we consider these are, as uh, areas of, of key attention. And, and within these, uh, we are looking into the digital transformation strategies of banks, so how banks are uh, dealing with the need um, to become more digital and what are the risks that uh, may arise from this uh, new uh, way of conducting their, uh, their business. Um, we are looking into the operational resilience uh, frameworks that also come um, as a, a, an important uh, risk uh, following the more digital uh, uh, business models of, uh, of banks. And then on governance, uh, a, particular, a particular focus on how uh, management uh, bodies are uh, functioning and steering uh, the banks and how um, risk data aggregation and reporting is working. Um, these were areas that in previous uh, analysis and reviews were identified as areas uh, uh, of in need of, of improvement. The third priority, uh, again, another uh, structural uh, challenge, uh, which is uh, uh, how the banks will be able to step uh, up their efforts in addressing uh, climate uh, change. Um, we might talk a bit more uh, uh, about these, uh, but uh, we have conducted a climate uh, stress test and, uh, and also a thematic uh, deep dive uh, on, on, on climate. And those two supervisory exercises um, uh, that work mainly learning exercises, both from our side and to the banks, revealed that there was still a, a, long, uh, a long way to go to, to, to be ready to, um, uh, to face uh, what could be material exposures to physical and transition uh, risks. So this is another area of attention in our supervisory priorities. Now moving into um, uh, zooming a bit into uh, what happened uh, in, in March 2023 and, and maybe uh, uh, only giving you a, a very light uh, um, perspective of, uh, of how we looked into these uh, events um, and what we learned uh, from them. Um, these, uh, these events, uh, both uh, in the US and in, in Switzerland, uh, made us uh, uh, go back again to the, to the, to the basic foundations of, uh, of banks and supervision of banks. Uh, the main elements uh, that led to, to all the crises were um, weaknesses in terms of risk management and, uh, and governance uh, for, from all these, uh, these, uh, these banks. Um, we also identified that uh, uh, strong supervision and uh, uh, effective regulation are, are critical. Um, uh, from a lessons learned perspective from the EU side, we see even more emphasis on, on the need to, to strengthen supervision in the direction that Lynette uh, just presented. So more risk-based, intrusive, um, with a clear uh, escalation uh, ladder of measures uh, to, uh, to push banks to address uh, uh, weaknesses identified. Um, the, the, the cases uh, in the US uh, raised particular questions in terms of uh, interest rate risk and liquidity risk in the current monetary policy uh, environment. Um, and also uh, raised a, a, a very relevant uh, point on uh, um, 
why after uh, all the reforms that, uh, that also uh, Lynette uh, just mentioned, uh, to be able to, to prepare our banks and our supervision to deal uh, with, uh, with these kind of uh, risks, why do we still, uh, why have we still uh, seen uh, a crisis like, uh, like in, the, in, in the US? Um, and what I wanted to, to, to emphasize here is that uh, the global banking rules in the EU apply to all banks independently of, the, of their size, but that's not uh, the, the, uh, the same uh, on the other side of, of, of the Atlantic. So we continue to put uh, um, uh, emphasis on these because I think this is one of the main, um, of the main differences. Um, why um, why do, we, do we think that, uh, that in a way um, the euro area banks uh, are not in the same uh, situation? Um, First of all, uh, following our uh, prioritization setting process that I just described, um, interest rate risk and liquidity risks were risks that were identified as uh, risks that will be under stress with the normalization of the monetary policy environment and the raising of the interest rates. So since uh, 2021, they were identified uh, clearly as priorities and we had uh, particular uh, supervisory actions uh, there. But also the euro area banks uh, do not uh, uh, um, exhibit the same uh, features and vulnerabilities as uh, banks like uh, Silicon uh, Valley uh, Bank. Um, just to, to mention two things, um, uh, we do not see the same uh, size of uh, unrealized losses uh, uh, in, in the balance sheet of our banks, but also um, the deposit uh, base and customer base, it's, it's much more diverse and, and not uh, uh, relying uh, significantly on concentrated and uninsured uh, uh, deposits. Still saying all of this, we see uh, no room for complacency, so we are continuing to monitor uh, closely, uh, uh, particularly these risks, as you have seen. Uh, on the liquidity side, um, we are really looking into uh, funding plans of banks, trying to understand um, uh, what will be uh, their um, sources of funding uh, going forward. Also taking into account that the, the, the costs, the, the cost of funding uh, has already increased also due to the interest rate uh, uh, rise. Uh, the banks are still uh, uh, benefiting from this interest rate uh, rise in terms of profitability, but we see, we start seeing some signals that the funding costs is, uh, is increasing, increasing, so this will, be, uh, will become more, uh, more uh, balanced. Um, finally, uh, just mentioning that we just uh, uh, finalized also a, a review of the bank's preparedness to the phase out of the TLTRO, well, uh, it's written there, the target long-term refinancing uh, operations, looking at banks' exit strategies and then focusing our attention on the ones uh, that are coming as uh, outliers or uh, showing more uh, vulnerabilities. And moving to the, to the last uh, slide, uh, just to share with you with the, what are being our main takeaways and, and maybe uh, even call them, calling them lessons learned uh, from this uh, March uh, term oil. Um, we see uh, uh, that uh, the, the, the main lessons uh, come more for supervisors rather than, uh, than, uh, than on the regulation uh, side. Uh, of course, the, the scope of application of a regulation may be an issue uh, in other jurisdictions, uh, uh, but not, uh, not uh, uh, um, uh, on our side. So we see that the lessons are, are more for us as supervisors um, and uh, a lot in line with uh, what we, are, we were already trying to, to implement and it was reinforced by the independent uh, experts that Lynette uh, mentioned that were also assessing our main supervisory and uh, review evaluation process, uh, which are, uh, we need to continue having uh, intrusive supervision, uh, identifying the findings, but then being able to escalate uh, and take uh, timely uh, measures to ensure that the banks take timely remedial uh, uh, actions. Um, 
we are also placing a, a lot of efforts in the in the in the areas of governance and risk management as as just uh, as just mentioned we continue to see i think this is one of the parallelisms with the 2008 uh, global financial crisis is that the issues are coming again from uh, from uh, weaknesses in governance and risk management so i think this will be areas that we will always need to 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 focus uh, uh, as supervisors um uh, but we do see that uh, that uh, what we need to strengthen is the way that we uh, and, and and overall globally uh, we conduct uh, supervision of course we welcome the follow up uh, work that is being uh, uh, done at uh, at international level the ecb participates actively in this uh, work both in terms of the the work developed by the basel committee but also by the financial stability uh, board um, and we have identified uh, just a few areas where uh, this work uh, um, is uh, is uh, is starting or developing um, on irbb and liquidity risk uh, uh, to also take into account uh, the experience of these last uh, events uh, namely on uh, how fast the deposits uh, moved from the banks, so uh, a completely different um, time uh, horizon to be able to tackle the crisis. Uh, but also from the FSB side, questions are being asked on uh, uh, the um, effectiveness and even the adequacy of the resolution uh, framework. Uh, we are convinced of, uh, of its adequacy, so it's more uh, on uh, how do we ensure that it is operationally uh, uh, implementable and the, what, are there any kind of uh, uh, constraints to that, so further work uh, uh, on that uh, uh, will, be, uh, will be done. Um, and also uh, in Europe, and you might be aware, um, the, the, the Commission proposed a review of our crisis uh, framework, so that's an area where the ECB will uh, actively uh, participate in the discussions and, uh, and is willing to, to, to contribute to try to, um, to uh, so that we have uh, an even uh, better uh, uh, framework that allows us to address any uh, potential uh, crisis, uh, because as much as we do, uh, I think we will never be able to say that, uh, that there won't be any other uh, crisis and uh, we need to be prepared, uh, we need to do our best to try to avoid them, but then also be prepared to tackle them um, in a way that ensures financial stability, um, deposit that deposits, uh, uh, covered deposits are guaranteed and taxpayer uh, money is not used to, 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 to then address the situation. Um, and with this, I thank you all for your attention and we are both uh, happy to take any questions or comments uh, from your side. Back to you, Connie. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lynette, and thank you, uh, Sophia, for for the, for that interesting uh, overview over where we've come from uh, nine years ago and uh, and where we're trying to go here. Um, so I have. Um, so now we're coming to you and your comments, questions. Um, that um, that we hope that you have. Um, so please, uh, you know, raise your hand. Your you know your digital, your electronic hand. I, I can see that if you do that, and I will call on you. Uh, and then, of course, you know, unmute yourself and uh, and turn on your camera if you can uh, and ask your question or make your comment. So um, I'm looking at the screen. I don't see anybody raising their hand yet, but uh, hopefully. Uh, you will have something ready. I know it was a lot of information in, in a fairly short period of time, but uh, um, you, you may be familiar with some of it already. But maybe I can just start the conversation here and uh, kick off with one question. And we've, um, we, we, we've the colleagues already, you know, went there a little bit. But of course, it's the ever-burning question that we get all the time and uh, that everybody always asks and that everybody, each one of us has in a way. Um, but um, maybe I'll ask you, Lynette, what can the ECB do to ensure that there is not another banking crisis in Europe? I mean, at least not to the extent that we've seen after the, uh, in the aftermath of the great financial crisis. Uh, no, thank, thanks a lot, Connie. I mean, I think um, I'm going to echo a lot of the points that we already made, I think, in the presentation. Um, but I mean, first of all, I would say that um, as we showed in the presentation, the banks are in a better situation than they were, you know, 10 years ago. 
um, in terms of, you know, capital, liquidity, um, asset quality, but also governance um, and risk management. And, you know, they have been, as, as Sophia was saying, they have been very resilient, actually, in, in, in the face of a number of these shocks that we've seen um, in recent years and in recent months. Um, and that is, you know, thanks to a strong regulatory framework, um, which we have in place, but also thanks to the hard work that our supervisors have done to really push the banks. I mean, our supervisors on the ground are there every day, you know, really... Uh, pushing the banks to to move ahead to take action and I think this is also uh, you know speaks to the success that uh, we have had in improving the resilience of the banks so far but um, supervisors by nature are never um, um, complacent I mean and um, we are always looking you know what could be coming over the horizon what could be the risks that are coming um, and you know if you ask what do we what should we do as banking supervisors um, I mean, I would echo Sophia, we have a regulatory framework that seems to be serving us quite well. Maybe some, some tweaks are needed. Um, but what we need to do as banking supervisors is to keep applying that framework and applying the powers that it gives us um, with purpose and determination. And I think Sophia referred to the concept of intrusive supervision. No? And I think in the past, we've even been accused of being too intrusive uh, with the banks, you know, you know, pushing them on governance, risk management, um, board effectiveness. But I think that is uh, the hallmark of a, of a good supervisor, to be intrusive. No, we, as supervisors, we need to be skeptical. We need to challenge the banks. Uh, we need to be proactive. Um, and um, as Sophia said, also um, willing to act and empowered to act. So really um, taking timely and effect effective action. And we have this concept of, you know, the escalation ladder to really sort of build and make sure very clearly that we have a plan for how to deal with with weaknesses that we that we see. And um, you know, even if we don't have banks like uh, Silicon Valley Bank, as Sophia already mentioned, and this was also the U.S. authorities did some um, you know, soul searching as a result of the of what happened in March, and actually some really critical self reflection. And one of their conclusions also was that you need very strong supervision. You need to follow up. You need to be proactive as a supervisor. And this is an area where they felt themselves they had perhaps not not gone far enough. So I think that is also pushing us in in that same direction. Um, and um, Sophia mentioned the fact that the European regulatory framework is applied to all banks, uh, so whether small or large. Um, and I think that's an important point as well, because there are also sometimes calls for more proportionality in the regulatory framework. We've seen this also in the past. And while I think, you know, for smaller banks, you can certainly and we can certainly see how we can reduce some of the burdens. Uh, and I think there have been some work done on, you know, reporting burdens and things like that. But we shouldn't um, soften uh, supervisory standards, and I think that, uh, sorry, regulatory standards, prudential standards, uh, capital requirements, liquidity, et cetera. And I think that's also something that the, the um, US colleagues have, have, have learned uh, a lesson there. Um, but in the end, and I think this is an important point because, um, you know, as supervisors, we can do so much, but in the end, you know, it really is the responsibility of the banks to, um, you know, take ownership of their, uh, their risks, identifying, managing their risks, um, having the, you know, the, the governance and the risk culture that they, they need to have. Um, and, you know, what we've seen at the heart of every crisis, every failure, I think, of, of a bank is underlying, there may be different triggers, but underlying the crisis is usually uh, a problem with governance or risk management. So I think this is something we should also be clear about. The banks need to take action. Thank you very much, uh, Lynette. Um, so I see a hand up uh, here. Uh, Lucas uh, Krebel, can you please unmute yourself? And yes, hello, please go ahead. Um, hi, hi, thanks very much for, for this presentation. Uh, yeah, I'm Lucas Krebel from the New Economics Foundation. Um, so I have a question. So it's very good to, to see that one of the three supervisory priorities is obviously addressing the, the climate uh, change. 
Um, so I have a related question on that topic. So uh, obviously, given now what we are witnessing right now, uh, the, the impacts of, of climate change, the record heat waves and so on, it looks like you know the, the risks of climate change may be materializing even faster than was anticipated by scientists. Um, but even if it was not so like we know they are very grave. So how do you consider like the systemic character of, of climate related risk that has impact on the whole economy more broadly and then obviously on the financial system? In, in your supervisory approach uh, to, to, to how we oversee uh, the banks in the Eurozone. If you could tell, tell, uh, tell me a bit more about that, it would be great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Would you like to take us over here? Yeah. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot for your question. Um, as you might have seen from, from the presentation, climate is one of, uh, of our uh, priorities in terms of uh, uh, how do, do we ensure that banks are prepared to um, uh, tackle the, the transition risks and how, how they are um, uh, already now uh, taking uh, climate risk as, as, uh, as uh, uh, an element that uh, may impact uh, them uh, on, on a number of uh, risk uh, uh, areas. Um, we have done, uh, uh, as I mentioned as well, um, a climate uh, stress test already in the 2022, um, and we did also uh, a thematic uh, review to look into how uh, banks were um, uh, able to have first uh, relevant uh, data, and how were they then able to um, to manage uh, uh, the the risks uh, uh, that come from uh, from uh, from uh, from climate, and um, uh, on both these exercises, so the stress test was the first time we did an exercise. Uh, it was really a learning exercise, both from the bank side and from the for the supervisors as well. Um, but we really identified uh, that there were um, uh, uh, deficiencies uh, still um, from. Uh, at that time, we published what would be our expectations. So what would be the expectations we have as supervisors that banks uh, 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 evolve and, and need to, to tackle. And we um, uh, followed up then uh, uh, with each bank, giving them a, a, a timeline and, the, and, the, uh, and what would be uh, the expectations that we would have them to deliver until uh, end of 2024, with some uh, milestones in 2023 that we are now uh, looking into and, uh, and, and assessing, but with a final uh, timeline of, of, uh, of 2024. Um, and they were informed that of what would be the steps that they would need to take to incorporate uh, climate-related and uh, environmental risks within their business strategy, their governance, their risk management uh, framework, their risk data uh, uh, aggregation, uh, etc. Um, and we would expect them to fully integrate these in their own internal processes, in their ICAP, in their stress testing uh, uh, frameworks, so to really be part of their um, regular uh, way of, uh, of working, uh, also with particular focus on, on credit risk, how do they look at uh, uh, um, um, the impact in terms of uh, credit risk in residential real estate, in commercial real estate uh, loans, uh, etc. And, uh, and the ECB will then assess uh, these, uh, these shortcomings. Uh, we have already done it in the 2022 uh, SREP, so the supervisory uh, review and evaluation process that we do every year. Um, and we have already taken some quali qualitative measures uh, there. Um, and now, um, with uh, having given uh, more time uh, to the banks, uh, we are even considering taking some quantitative measures on the ones that are uh, uh, um, uh, showing uh, um, uh, more weaknesses. And if, uh, if necessarily, uh, we will also take uh, enforcement act actions to make sure that the banks are uh, going in the right direction. Uh, I want to be fair, we see already some progress. Uh, but we are still uh, not where we would like uh, uh, the banks uh, to be. So this continues to be uh, an area of uh, particular attention and one of our supervisory priorities uh, for the cycle of 23-25. I don't know, Lynette, if you want to add. 
If I may, only one point I I would add is is that, and um, you alluded to this, Sophia, that this is a learning experience uh, for for us, and I I think one of the things which. Um, you know, we hear sometimes from the banks about the difficulties they face, but we also learn from some of the banks about how they overcome some of those difficulties. And it's been important to publish some good practices um, and to share a little bit, you know, how some of the banks are dealing with these, some of the challenges around data and things like that. And I think that's something that we should continue to, to share and disseminate, disseminate as much as possible. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, did you have another question, uh, um, Lukas, or is, is it, I hope you <laughs> was answered. So let's oh, see. Yeah, thank you. Uh, maybe if you can have a follow up. If sure, please. Okay. please. Yeah. yeah, thanks for those answers. Um, yeah, so uh, a follow up question is, um, so how do you then uh, also consider, you know, given that, you know, the bank's activities make, make some contribution to climate change themselves, like, you know, the type of activities they find us and they do not find us, and, you know, having in the view the European climate goals and uh, the view for transition to net zero and, you know, EU climate law themselves committed to Paris Agreement. So how are you considering those that, you know, the banks to meet uh, your expectations, to what extent they are aligned with, with those goals, which if they do align with them, obviously that will have some impact on reducing systemic risk in the longer term by having, you know, less uh, financing of political activities. So to what extent you are considering, you know, this interplay between uh, uh, supervision and what the banks do and the actual impacts on the climate and not just pure risks towards banks? Thank you. Um, well, I, I would like to, to stress that uh, as supervisors and as potential supervisors, we are more we are uh, mainly looking into 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 the risks. No, the risks. Um, uh, we look uh, at at uh, climate and environmental risks uh, from a risk perspective, right? So we we look and we look at it through uh, our uh, traditional risks so how what 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 would what um, will be the impact in terms of uh, sorry credit risk but also of course in terms of, of, of strategy uh, uh, in terms of uh, business model uh, sustainability if you can if you if you want to to to, to call it like that um, so we do have this more broader perspective but we always come through the angle of the of the risks of the of uh, potential for for uh, the soundness and safety uh, 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 of the of the banks and this is always the perspective that we take when we, when we look into climate and uh, environmental uh, uh, risks. And if you look at the way um, that we are uh, uh, acting, what we are uh, pushing uh, the banks uh, to is uh, first that they are able to identify the risks and that they are able to then uh, monitor and manage those, uh, those risks. Um, uh, so I think this will this needs to be also uh, clear. There are other uh, institutions that are taking more uh, uh, more more political view, etc. From our side, we are really uh, looking into it from a prudential uh, uh, perspective. Thank you very much. Let's see. Um, I ha we have another question here from Alexander Simic. Alexander, please. Would you uh, unmute yourself and turn your camera on if you can? Yes, thank you. Thank you for the presentation. I'm uh, Alexander Simic from the Sustainable Finance Lab in the Netherlands. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, so one is the, the follow up to the previous one. Uh, uh, you mentioned that uh, the enforcement action might be taken against banks that are not going in, in the right direction. So I'm wondering uh, if you could be a bit more concrete as to um, what this action is. And the second question is, uh, uh, we talked about climate related financial risks, but I'm curious uh, as to how the ECB looks at nature related financial risks. Thank you. I could not hear well the last part. Can you just repeat the last part of your second question? Oh. I think that. Sorry, of course. Yes. So, so I'm curious uh, uh, about nature related financial risks. So, so this is a uh, uh, a bit of a, a broader term than, than only climate and and these uh, two groups of risks uh, um, interact um so uh, i'm curious uh, as to how you, how you see uh, this group of, of of risks thank you 
thanks a lot um so on the first uh, on the first uh, question um what I would stress is that uh, uh, when uh, when looking into risks, uh, uh, we uh, look at all our supervisory tools to be able to uh, push banks to act and to remediate uh, weaknesses that we identify in our supervisory uh, work. So we look at uh, the full uh, toolkit uh, where, uh, of course, enforcement and sanctions are uh, one of the tools that we have uh, 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 available to 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 act. Uh, so, when mentioning uh, uh, um, th that, uh, what I wanted to say is that we see climate and environmental risks. So, a bit also answering uh, now already your second question is not only climate. We look at uh, uh, anything that uh, could be materially impacting. Um, uh, the, 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 the business of, of, of the banks. And uh, we, uh, we then look at our toolkit and, and see and identify what are the best uh, supervisory measures to achieve uh, the supervisory objectives uh, that, we, uh, that we have. And, and those could be, um, depending on uh, the, where we are, uh, also in our escalation ladder, as, as uh, Lynette uh, uh, already alluded to. So we do have an approach that starts with the supervisory dialogue with the bank when we identify um, uh, issues, concerns, vulnerabilities. Uh, we might then follow with the recommendations or very uh, clear sharing of uh, expectations uh, so the banks uh, know what the, what what the, they need to do, what we expect them to, to, to do. And then we start an escalation ladder if we see that, uh, that there are no uh, actions or adequate actions being taken by, uh, by, by the banks. And these could, uh, could be of uh, very different uh, natures. We could have uh, qualitative measures, quantitative measures that could be um, uh, pillar two in, in uh, pillar two requirements. Uh, uh, or even uh, enforcement and, uh, and, uh, and, and sanctions. So the adequacy of the measure, of the supervisory measure to be adopted depends on the case-by-case -case assessment of the situation, uh, but the full toolkit is available and for, for the impact uh, uh, of climate risk and the way the banks manage these risks, the full uh, supervisory toolkit uh, is available for us to, to then uh, act if, if necessary. And then uh, again, uh, um, just to stress, uh, we look at uh, risks, risks that are material, uh, and we see climate and environmental risks uh, more broadly uh, as being uh, as being uh, um, uh, potentially material. So the banks need to look into into those, and to any other that uh, uh, could be material, depending on the business model of, of, of each of uh, of the bank, uh, and this will be. Uh, an assessment uh, that needs to be conducted by by our uh, joint supervisory teams, but with the support uh, both from the uh, horizontal off-site supervision and the horizontal on-site uh, supervision as well. Thank you very much. Um, do you have a follow-up by any chance, Alexander, or is this, um, or I presume yeah. you? No, 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 I'm I'm happy with the response. All right, thank you, All right. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't see any uh, other questions. Um, any other comments, questions from from you? Don't see anything there. Um, you know, if you want to uh, wanted to add anything, or um, because if you if there are no more burning questions here, I mean, we would uh, come to conclusion. I mean, we have a few minutes left. If there's anybody who still has a last minute question, but um, but if not, then um, maybe we'll we'll conclude here um, because oh sorry, now here we have a last minute question. So Clarice Murphy, please. Uh, Yes, hi. Um, hi. Thank you for um, giving me some time for the question. So I'm Clarice Murphy from Reclaim Finance, and um, I just had a question about um, uh, stress tests. And um, I mean, the as you were saying, like most of the work you've been doing has been quite uh, like it's the learning curve. You are kind of learning along the way of what works and what doesn't quite work. Um, and there's been kind of some studies lately on how uh, the climate scenarios are being considered for the stress tests or um, usually quite poor, um, or at least don't really reflect the reality of um, and climate change and the 
um, the real consequences that it will have. So I was thinking, how do you take those um, into account and how are you kind of reviewing your stress test and um, yeah, kind of this approach to this? Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Clarissa, for, for, for the question. I, I think it's it's quite an important question. Um, the adequacy of the of the scenarios in the in a stress test are are are, are critical, no? So um just to 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 clarify, I think it's clear, but um, when I mentioned the climate uh, risk stress test, this is a very specific uh, one. So we conduct also um, a general uh, uh, stress test uh, um, uh, every two years together with the with the, the with the European Banking Authority, with the EBA. Um, uh, they have a sample of banks. We then uh, uh, include also the remaining uh, uh, SSM uh, uh, banks, and and these uh, stress tests are uh, it's much broader not than than only than only uh, climate. And this year's stress test, we will be publishing the results uh, uh, later this month, uh, 28th of, of, of July. And, um, and the scenarios were quite uh, severe from, uh, from an overall perspective. But I think you were asking more in terms of the climate, the specific climate stress test. So besides this uh, overall, including uh, all the sector uh, stress test, we do have some uh, um, some more targeted uh, stress tests. We conducted uh, the climate uh, one in 2022. The idea is to be continuing uh, doing those, uh, also to 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 be able to see how uh, the situation is, is is developing. And of course, the scenarios will need to be adapted, as uh, as also the the um, um, uh, the the situation is evolving. Uh, no. Um, the scenarios are usually taking into account uh, uh, analysis from uh, from uh, organizations that are also looking particularly into how uh, climate is uh, is uh, is evolving so i would expect and the stress test is supposed to have quite severe scenarios to really test the ability of the banks to um, um, to undergo these uh, crisis events, these impactful uh, uh, events, but also to identify where could be uh, weaknesses and try to address them at an early stage. So the the, the stress test. Uh, uh, um, uh, gives us uh, a lot of information that also allows us then to tackle uh, the, the 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 situations, both from a, from a, do we need uh, to to address uh, anything in terms of uh, capital or uh, is it uh, should it be through qualitative measures? Again, we have again the the toolkit uh, the, tool, the 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 overall tool, toolkit uh, open. So I would expect that the scenarios are uh, still plausible but quite severe uh, scenarios. For, for any stress test that, that is conducted um, uh, from, our, from our side. All right, thank you very much. Um, I hope that answered your question, Clarice. Um, if now I don't see any more hands, um, so, and we have come to the end of our um, hour here, uh, at the end of the seminar, thank you very much uh, for joining. Um, I just uh, just a couple of points. Um, we have a uh, a feedback survey which um, we the colleagues are calling up right now, and we would really appreciate if you would fill that out so we can, um, you know, use your your comments to improve and uh, you know to to keep uh, you know uh, um, doing these uh, seminars uh, and um, you know to to build that into our next seminar series. Um, so while you fill out this uh, very quick survey, I, I can thank our speakers, uh, Lynette and Sophia, for, for their availability to, uh, and to give us uh, their uh, insights. And, uh, and I thank you very much for, for participating and, he, um, and asking your questions. So um, we, you know, we cannot, of course, predict. I mean, you heard here, um, probably not first, that we cannot predict the next shock. We cannot predict the next banking crisis. <laughs> but of course, we uh, work uh, very diligently to uh, to avoid any of that or to uh, mitigate it. That's why we're here, and um, and we, of course, you know, keep. Um, keep improving, keep adjusting, and um, ho hopefully, um, you know, helping the banks uh, become, you know, and uh, remain resilient and become more resilient. So with that, I thank you all very much and have a good uh, evening and the rest of the day. Thank you. Bye.